Hello, welcome back to Money Talks. My name's Ian. Uh, so in my last video, I wanted to talk about why I thought the stock market was gonna crash pretty soon and uh, why it was gonna crash, when it was gonna crash, what was, what's behind it. Obviously, we've kind of already seen a correction uh, from last week. So I wanna kind of talk about the ideas I had um, a few weeks ago and see if they're kind of happening or if there's still valid points uh, or catalysts for this correction. Hello, welcome to Money Talks. In case you're new here, my name's Ian and on my channel we talk about finance, investing, and making money. As you can see, I'm not at home. I am in the Virgin Islands, actually, right here. We are in Charlotte, Amelie, uh, at an Airbnb. And it's raining right now, so I intended to make this video here, so I just want to do it right now while it's raining so I can make the best use of my time. So let's take a look here. So I really started thinking about this stock market crash or correction uh, after watching a few of Meet Kevin's videos, uh, particularly the ones with Harry Dent, Peter Schiff, Ali Moez, as well as the Bloomberg interview with Jeremy Grantham. All of these people have different views on what will cause the crash or what caused the crash that just happened, uh, but they all seem to have pretty valid points. As you can hear, there's a lot of roosters out there uh, crowing. It's This is the first time I've been to a tropical island. It's pretty exciting to be here. The first video I saw uh, on Meet Kevin's channel was the interview with uh, Peter Schiff. Now Peter Schiff is seems like he's always a perpetual bear um, and he thinks that there's going to be a massive inflation uh, and this inflation is going to cause uh, stocks to go down and basically everything to go down. These stocks, these tech stocks, are particularly vulnerable to a rise in interest rates because these are growth stocks that are promising to uh, pay earnings in the future. Right. When interest rates are zero, well, it doesn't matter. You're willing to wait indefinitely because there's no opportunity cost of waiting. But as interest rates start to go up, uh, the cost of waiting for your money in the future also goes up. So that means that the valuations of those stocks come down and they have a long way to drop to get back to even a historic norm. And you know, unless the Fed comes in, and really reassures the market that it's going to print a lot more money, which I think the market should be able to figure out anyway, because that's clearly what the Fed's going to do. But I think the markets are waiting for something more proactive to stop the, the decline. Otherwise, I think it's going to continue. So he says we should just all get into gold. If you're a smart investor, get into gold. Um, that's all kind of ridiculous to me. But I think let's wait for this plane to pass. All right, so gold is basically like 1% of my portfolio. It's not, I'm not gonna make it any more than like 1% ever. Uh, so I think, I'm, I'm not gonna follow Peter's investing advice here, but I think the points he makes about why the market's gonna crash um, is, is a valid thing you have to consider. There might be massive inflation because uh, of all this money printing. Now, the other components of inflation, the, the higher, uh, growth and, and increased spending hasn't happened yet because that velocity of money hasn't increased uh, quite yet because we're still in, in a pandemic. So uh, something to consider there with Peter Schiff's argument. The second interview I watched was with Harry Dent and Harry Dent is also one of those perpetual bulls or he's a perpetual bear uh, and he thinks there's going to be a massive deflation uh, soon. And he wants, he, he thinks if you're a smart investor, you should get out of stocks into bonds, uh, which I think I would never move all my money into bonds. Uh, bonds are maybe like five or 10% of my portfolio. But he does make some good points. Like uh, if you look at the past 10 years, we've been on this printing money uh, growth like trajectory for the past 10 years, ever since 2008. And there hasn't really been a true correction. So he thinks, there's going to be a massive deflation. And now all these traders leverage up uh, at, at almost no cost at zero interest rates and add leverage to that. And that's how financial assets are now the biggest bubble ever. Financial asset mm -hmm. bubbles can burst overnight, like 29 to 32. 
And we saw last year, just in five weeks from February to March, globally, stocks crashed 40 percent in the U.S. It was 35 on the S&P, 44 percent on the Russell 2000. Stock, bubbles can burst much faster. And you have to understand, this is all wealth. Debt is wealth. You know, financial assets is wealth. Cash and stuff is too. But but a couple hundred trillion dollars is going to disappear, I think, in the next couple of years. And I think that's what burst the bubble. I know you have a feeling, you know, that, that they, you know, they can pull some more tricks and stuff. And, and, and normally a, a, a downturn is triggered when the Fed raises rates and, and inflation mm-hmm. is going. We are getting some mild rises in inflation, but I still don't think you're going to get much. We are in a deflationary era, Kevin. I've given all my mm-hmm. speeches. I literally come out and say it's impossible to create high, even normally high inflation in this high debt, high bubble environment because it all wants to deleverage and deflate. It's impossible to create the hyperinflation that the gold bugs are looking at. This will end in deflation. It will end in high unemployment, high business failure. Most of all, hundreds, I'm estimating 200 to 250, 40 to 50 percent of that 520 disappears. That hurts. You don't get a recession when that happens. You get a depression like 29 to 32. Most recessions do not see big financial asset bubbles and debt deleveraging. Only in the 30s and only now. Harry Dent and Peter Schiff have kind of have conflicting analyses of what's actually going to happen, but they both kind of have valid arguments that you can you can think about. Then the next guy, Meet Kevin, interviewed was Ali Moez uh, or Moyes or something. Uh, he's a bit of a younger guy. He's not he's he's not a perpetual bear, which is uh, refreshing. He really thinks that the causes of the correction uh, or the crash that's to come are high uh, margin rates, so high high amounts of people borrowing money to uh, buy stocks. Uh, so that compounded with high asset prices, so high uh, growth stock prices. For example, like Tesla is very, it's it's very expensive to buy. It's the P/E ratio, the price to earnings ratio, is over a thousand, or it was over a thousand a few days ago. It's probably a little bit lower now, but he thinks expensive stocks plus high margin rates are going to cause uh, the correction or crash. And I think that's kind of already what we've, what we've been seeing over the last uh, week or so. Like, look, if you do believe that these are frothy valuations, then margin is the last thing you want to be in. Get out of margin right. completely. Um, um, you know, don't don't try to stay away from derivatives uh, and, and, and rotate into things that are winning but are much more reasonably priced, right? And like, look, if, mm. if, if you don't make 50% a year and you're only doing 10% a year for the next few years and you're able to survive a crash, like, is that bad? Like, that's, that's perfectly fine. Like, remember the long-term returns that people have seen for, you know, 100, 200 years is 10% a year, right? Right, so, right. So the world yeah. we're the world we're in, where we're like doubling our money or tripling our money every year, this is not sustainable. Like the world isn't big enough for these companies. Like, you know, we we'd have to have, I don't know, like the market would have to be ten times bigger for some of these growth rates to actually work out into infinity. So So Ali Moes's argument is probably the one I agree with the most it seems like it's it's the most based on data and he's also uh, a little bit more of a a newer younger fresher investor so i kind of can relate to him more another person i follow is uh, uh sven carlin he has a channel about value investing i think his channel is a, a really good way to balance out uh perspectives on stock investing so i follow meet kevin and i i believe in the growth stocks that he talks about Tesla, uh, all those small cap growth stocks uh, that really don't have any income yet, but are, have we all have high expectations for them. Uh, so meet Kevin, growth stocks. Uh, I, I follow Sven Carlin to kind of balance that out because Sven talks about value stocks and how growth stocks might not be all they're cracked up to be and value stocks are the only way to really get consistent returns because most value stocks are based on future expected cash flows so dividends and uh, cash flows uh, free cash flows so you know when you're investing you're expecting something in return so that's what a lot of value stocks are based on 
uh, dividend uh, cash flows. So I've kind of been following SPIN uh, just to kind of balance out my perspectives on stocks. So I've been moving uh, since early February, I've been moving a little bit of my portfolio over to value stocks. Uh, so it's something to think about. Obviously, I'm not a financial planner or tax consultant or anything. So do your own research here. Uh, one other thing I forgot to mention, uh, Grantham, uh, he is an older gentleman. He, had, he did an interview on Bloomberg that I think Pat has gotten like a million views so far. Uh, but he has some really interesting and valid perspectives. Uh, and he is also a fan of moving into value stocks. But these are spectacular performances. My, my own uh, stock in uh, QuantumScape, it, uh, it came into the market at 10 and, and shot up uh, to 130. At 130, uh, it was bigger than General Motors or Panasonic. Uh, and this is a, a, a brilliant company, but it has no trouble admitting that it won't be producing any batteries for four years. So no sales, no profits, and bigger than GM. There is nothing like that in 1929, nothing of that scale, nothing like that in 2000. 1929, of course, ran into uh, the Great Depression and global trade problems. So um, you really just want to look at the first leg down, which was big enough. The analogy is much better with 2000. In 2000, it went down 50%. And the reason it only went down 50 and, and bounced back uh, relatively quickly was, uh, was because the Fed came charging in uh, to the rescue. And uh, you can have a lot of rescues when you start at a 16% long government bond in 1982. You can have a bull market as you go down from 16 to 12, and another bull market from 12 to 8, and another bull market from 8 to 4. But now you're down at 2.5 or whatever. Uh, you have to realize that most of the easy pickings uh, of, of saving the game by ramping rates down is behind us. At the lowest rates in history, uh, you don't have a lot in the bank to throw on the table, do you? What is to stop valuations from climbing even higher for years, possibly? Um, put it this way. When you have reached this level of obvious super enthusiasm, the bubble has always, without exception, broken in the next few months, not a few years. It's always. You can't maintain this level of near ecstasy. It can't be done because you've put in your last dollar. You are all in. What are you supposed to do beyond that point? You can't borrow any more money. You can't take any more risk. In fact, you know in your heart of hearts you have never taken this level of risk and you never thought you would. It's just that this opportunity is so exceptional. Uh, this is going to be your once in a lifetime. And, and how do you keep that level of enthusiasm going indefinitely? He thinks that there's a growth stock bubble and, a, uh, uh, and an index fund bubble that's fueled by growth stocks. So he is a big proponent of moving over into, moving more into value uh, over the coming months. Make sure to get your free stock slice with uh, public, the public stock app link down in the description. Also, you should sign up with M1, my favorite uh, portfolio management app. You can manage your IRA, you can manage your Roth IRA, you can have a taxable account, they have savings account, all that. Link is also in the description. That's where most of my money is stored and I'm very happy with it. I got my Roth IRA in there, I got my taxable long-term brokerage account in there and it's a great app you can set up little pies and distribute your money however you feel like you want to it is uh, super flexible the greatest investing app in the world so let's just look at some of the data that i've looked at uh, over the past few weeks so so one of the things that i really think uh, is something to pay attention to is that P.E. ratios uh, for the S&P 500 have increased uh, a lot over the past uh, year or over the last five years and particularly the last year as valuations have gone up so high. So I think that's something to really pay attention to. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily an indicator, but it seems like there's always a lot of uh, crashes and corrections right after P.E. ratios get really high. In the 1929 Great Depression stock uh, crash, the P.E. ratio uh, got really high. I think it was 
over a hundred or something like that. And then in, in the dot com bubble of 2000, uh, 1999, 2000 PE ratios also got very high, particularly for certain dot uh, com sites. Uh, they got very high and that's that just preceded the crash. So that's an indicator, but I'm not going to place all my money on that indicator. Uh, the next thing, um, if you particularly look at the stock market over the past six months, you'll see this kind of parabolic uh, uptrend in the stock market. And that just kind of sets off alarm bells in my head. It's just, you can't always go parabolic. So um, as we've seen over the past few weeks or, or actually month, we've seen kind of a leveling out, um, which is, is good. So we've kind of corrected that exponential growth and um, you know we're not we're not going parabolic because once you go parabolic and it's just like straight vertical like that's just that just sets off alarm bells in my head and uh, I only think there can be a crash uh, very soon at that point so we've kind of leveled off and tapered down so I think that really helps reduce the chance of a major crash uh, anytime soon I do think we're still gonna see uh, some corrections over the next like month or so uh, but again, I'm not a financial advisor. <laughs> uh, another thing that really kind of uh, tipped me off over the past few months was the whole GameStop, Wall Street bets exuberance. When I saw that, I was like, okay, this is a sign. Everybody's trying to get into GameStop. Everybody's downloading Robinhood. Once, once your mother asks you if you should invest in GameStop, that's when I know I should uh, probably, definitely not invest in GameStop, but really consider like, okay, something's gonna happen in the next few months like there's so much money piling in into the market so the whole GameStop fiasco was just uh, a little bit of an alarm bell for me and then if we just go look through YouTube you can see all these finance stock guys uh, talking about their favorite like 10x stocks and you can really see that this has grown a lot over the past few months and these views are getting hundreds of thousands of views and it's just guys talking about their favorite 10x stocks and that just also that's just not sustainable like last year was not a sustainable growth trajectory and it's just not going to keep going like that so uh, that's why i thought uh, you know i just think 2021 is going to be a lot slower of a growth year and we're going to see a bit of a correction and this is one that really got me thinking in early february uh, i went to the gym and i noticed that everybody that was looking at their phone in between sets was looking at Robin Hood. They're, they're, scrolling through, they're scrolling through their stocks on Robin Hood, uh, looking at their game stonk stocks. And that was just like, oh my God, everybody and their mother is on Robin Hood now. Like, this is crazy. There's just, there's so many retail investors getting in and they don't really know what they're doing. Uh, so this is a quote that I think is really fitting for the past few months, uh, maybe the past six months. And it's just very, something you can, should consider uh, in this day and age. This is a quote from Joe Kennedy in 1929, right before the stock market crash. So, when your shine boy gives you stock tips, it's time to get out of the market. And I think that quote is very fitting for what I saw at the gym in early February. Everybody on their stock market app, looking at their stocks I think it's very pertinent obviously I don't think you should get out of the stock market I think you should just buy more once you uh, kind of find your bottom wherever that might be uh, your bottom might have been last week or it could be in the next uh, few weeks or it could be this coming week who knows but I think this Joe Kennedy quote is very appropriate for what we're seeing right now so here's what you should do obviously don't actually listen to me. I'm just a guy on YouTube talking about stocks, but here's kind of what I've been doing and just listen and see what you think about it. So one of my favorite books is uh, Anti-Fragile by uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb, And he talks about an investing barbell strategy where you have very low risk assets on one end of the barbell and then you have nothing really in the middle. like. The middle would be like your you know, medium risk investments. Um, so you have your bonds over here, for example, and then you might have your like super high risk growth stocks over here. So you have 50% uh, in bonds and 50% in growth stocks and nothing really in the middle, nothing in the middle ground. 
Um, so I think this is a great way to organize a portfolio, have super low risk and super high risk. That way, if all your super high risk assets fail, you still have your low risk uh, bonds, uh, for example. It can be anything, it could be gold or whatever you want. to. And that way you have balance. You still have your super high risk, high growth potential assets over here. So that's kind of uh, how I've been organizing my uh, portfolio over the past few years is with a barbell strategy. Another thing you should consider is uh, moving money into Berkshire Hathaway. Warren Buffett likes to buy a value stock. So it's full of value stocks, um, value stocks that pay dividends. However, these dividends don't get passed through Berkshire Hathaway. They, uh, they get included in earnings and that's what causes the stock price to go up for Berkshire Hathaway. So I think that's a great value play for a taxable brokerage account because there's no dividends. You don't have to pay taxes on that. Uh, on, there's no dividends. So you don't have to pay taxes on dividends. So Berkshire Hathaway, good stock to consider that kind of, uh, it keeps up with the market, but sometimes it doesn't really, it kind of does the opposite of the market over the years. So some years, uh, for example, 2020, it didn't do that well um, over the course of 2020, definitely compared to the S&P 500. But on years where the S&P 500 did poorly, sometimes uh, Warren Buffett and, and Berkshire Hathaway actually has a very good amount of growth, like 10, 20% sometimes. So Berkshire Hathaway is a good way to kind of like balance out your portfolio with some value stocks. Another stock I just discovered recently is Virtue Financial. That is ticker symbol V-I-R-T. This is a high frequency trading firm and they, uh, they have a, an interesting stock chart. Basically, whenever stocks in the S&P 500 go down, uh, Virtue goes up. And then when the rest of the market's going up, Virtue kind of like goes down a little bit. So it kind of balances out your stock portfolio. But on top of that, it pays a really good dividend. So it's a great asset to hold in a tax advantaged account, uh, like a 401k or an IRA. Another thing to point out is that it's got a really low PE ratio. I think it's like uh, eight uh, price to earnings ratio. So a really good value dividend stock that does the opposite of the rest of the stock market. So just a good way to balance out your portfolio. Another market sector to consider, especially if you're heavily invested in US tech stocks, is emerging market stocks. So emerging markets are not as frothy as the US markets. They've had a lot lower of a growth ratio over, over the past 10 years, but they pay very good dividends and they usually have pretty low price to earnings ratios. So they are, for the most part, value stocks. Since they pay good dividends, it might be a good idea to keep these in a tax sheltered account like a 401k or Roth IRA. And one of my favorite ways to buy into emerging markets is through ETFs. Because let's be honest, I don't really know that much about emerging markets. I just know they usually have good value plays and they have good dividends. My favorite emerging market ETF, okay, the, the rain's really picking up here. Uh, my favorite emerging market ETF is the uh, TLTE uh, ETF. And this is basically a, uh, an emerging market ETF that doesn't use a market cap weighting to uh, weight their holdings. It uh, uses a tilt. So instead of, for example, Alibaba might be the highest weighted stock in a traditional emerging market ETF, this ETF tilts the weighting towards the lower end. So Alibaba will have a slightly uh, lower holding. So if it was gonna be 10% of the ETF, it might be 8% in this one in, in TLTE. Uh, and that market weighting will go towards a smaller cap stock. So it kind of balances out the big stocks from the smaller ones. So you get a little bit more weighting in the smaller uh, mid and small cap stocks. Another one that I really like is ES. GD. This is an ESG fund of emerging market stocks. So if you're into environmental, social, and governance investing, this is an ETF that focuses on emerging markets, uh, but it's all uh, ESG stocks. So stocks that place a high importance on environmental, social, and governance. Some other good value stocks are grocery store stocks. 
particularly my two favorites are Kroger and Sprouts Farmers Market. Now Kroger has been around for a lot longer. They have a good dividend. They have a fairly low PE ratio. Uh, so you're getting value here and nobody's gonna stop shopping at grocery stores. So I think Kroger is a great place to park money and earn dividends forever. I would say uh, you probably wanna put your Kroger in your tax sheltered account, your 401k, your IRA, just so you don't have to pay taxes on those dividends. And then the next grocery store stock is Sprouts Farmers Market. Uh, Kroger is KR by the way, that's the ticker. Sprouts Farmers Market is SFM. And Sprouts Farmers Market is a little bit of a newer farmers market or grocery store. It has kind of a farmers market like atmosphere. Uh, small stores mainly focused on organic and whole foods and all that. Sprouts Farmers Market has a very low PE ratio. I think it was eight or nine last time I checked. So very good value stock. Does not pay a dividend, so it'd be great for a taxable account. And overall, I just think the stock is very underappreciated and it's undervalued. And I think it's a great place to park money. And the next thing we should consider to balance out our portfolio is using bonds. Uh, I know I hate to say it, bonds are very boring, but there's some pretty cool things about bonds. So most bonds pay uh, earnings, they pay interest, essentially a dividend. And uh, corporate bonds, for example, pay pretty good dividends. And uh, you know, keep these in a, in a tax sheltered account, uh, you know, just a few percent. I have like maybe 5% corporate bonds in my Roth IRA. So just uh, some way to balance out your account. Uh, the other thing to consider is municipal bonds. Municipal bonds are pretty cool because they are uh, not taxed at the federal level. So you don't pay any federal income tax on the earnings. You're only getting like one or 2% on these, but at least you don't have to pay any federal income tax on them. And then the other bond we can consider is uh, treasury bonds, US treasury bonds. These are even more boring because they, they pay like one, 1.5% depending on uh, which bond fund you buy. I usually buy my bonds in ETFs uh, like BND. Treasury bonds are not taxable, uh, aren't taxed at the state income tax level or local income tax level. So they're only paying uh, federal income tax on treasury bond income. So that was a lot. Uh, so just some things to consider. I hope you liked the video. Make sure to subscribe and click the like button if you got any value out of this. Also, you could share it with someone, that'd be cool. Uh, if you didn't like the video, uh, you know, thumbs down all the way, whatever you wanna do. Uh, thank you very much for watching and I will see you next time.